Well, hello, Sam's fans, and welcome again to another Facebook Live broadcast. Again, I have a really exciting interview today. I'm interviewing Dr. Anthony Meadows. He's a music therapist. Uh, I'm sure if any music therapist you know him, he is the director of music therapy studies at Shenandoah University. He got his PhD from Temple University, and uh, he has worked as a music therapist in a school setting for children with disabilities, as well as um, the Joan Cornell's Cancer Center, Pennsylvania Hospital. Uh, so he's done a lot of clinical work, but then he also won an award from the American Music Therapy Association to examine the effectiveness of music imagery in managing symptoms related to community therapy infusions which we'll talk a little bit about, and as well as some research on clinical improvisation. And another interesting thing uh, that we might be able to talk a little bit about is that he is the editor of Music Therapy Perspectives, which is a journal on music therapy. Um, yeah, so thank you for joining us, Dr. Meadows. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here. And for anybody watching, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to drop it on the comments, um, any comments as well that you may have. Um, so yeah, just to start with, um, I, I know that you studied your bachelor in Australia. So are you from Australia? I, a long time ago, yes. I was born in Australia and I've been living in the States for about uh, 20, more than 20 years now. but grew up in Australia. Okay. Gotcha. And just the question would be, you studied in Australia first and then you studied in the US. So I'm just curious if there is any difference that you noticed in how music therapy is taught and practiced. The, I mean, the, I think that the kind of clinical practice actually is similar across the two countries. The, there's training differences. So at, in Australia, you study music therapy only at the graduate level. And um, the, at the graduate level, there's two parts. There is the actual um, certification training. And at the doctoral level, it's really a research degree. So Melbourne University has a very big research program. Um, two very, very fine music therapists who are leading the program there. Um, um, Felicity Baker and Kat Skews, and they're having really a very big impact internationally. The field itself is quite small in Australia, so to the best of my knowledge, there's about 300 music therapists in Australia, mm -hmm. and there's really one main academic training program in Melbourne, and then some specialty training programs in Sydney. Okay. All right, and, and so you studied their bachelor's, and then mm -hmm both master's and doctorate in the U.S., right? That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was your focus, for example, for your PhD? Um, I looked at the ways that music therapists think about their clients from their mm -hmm. gender. So I looked at oh. differences of perspective about male and female clients in, mm -hmm. a particular, in a particular kind of psychotherapy method called guided imagery and music. Interesting. Yeah, we haven't really talked much about these cultural issues in music therapy. I'm sure at some point that would be a really interesting conversation yeah. to yeah. have. Um, but for now, I, I really wanted to jump into some of the um, projects that you've done with this research it because they sound really interesting. Um, especially for us as fans, we support mainly music therapy for seriously ill children and their families, right? So that's usually children's hospitals, programs, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so when I saw that you did this research on music and imagery uh, in managing symptoms related to chemotherapy, therapy, I thought that would be a great uh, topic to talk about as it relates to what, all the things that we do. So uh, maybe let's start with when and how did this come about? Well, maybe I should start just by talking a little bit about the cancer center work that I did. Would, shall I start there and talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And then that might give a context. So um, I worked at the Joan Carnell Cancer Center for about 12 years. 
as part of an interdisciplinary team there that was made up of social workers and psychologists and nutritional counselors, uh, um, shiatsu therapist and a clinical medical team as well. And we really did uh, wrap around care services for patients. So that included inpatient work, outpatient work and post-treatment work. And the work that I mostly focused on, in fact, was actually post-treatment. And the so I'll talk a little bit about that in, in just a minute because it's um, I think it's a really interesting part of music therapy work. But mm -hmm. I'll talk about the inpatient or the sorry, the treatment work that I did first, because that's related to the study. So I um, provided um, music therapy sessions for patients during chemotherapy. And these were outpatient adults who wanted a music therapy intervention while they were actually receiving their infusions and mostly because of stress and anxiety related things. And these were usually folks that were doing intensive outpatient work. So they would they'd be in treatment for you know, um, six straight weeks or three on, one off, or um, I'm sure if the parents listening for their own kids that they'll, they'll understand the intensity of that, that kind of chemotherapy work. And the what happened for some folks, we think it's about 40% of patients where they have a level of distress that, that was not manageable for them. And mm -hmm. they wanted some kind of support during the actual infusion. And, and we got, I got a lot of referrals from the nurses to do stress management interventions, of which one of them was, the, was a music and imagery intervention. And it was primarily relaxation based. Mm -hmm. And so over the course of the, of the probably five or six years leading up to the study, I probably did six or 700 sessions with, with patients. Wow. And that 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 the overwhelming feedback was that they felt less stressed and anxious and they felt healthier. They actually felt better for mm -hmm. um, having received that intervention. And this was, you know, a, an hour session scheduled during the infusion in a private room in the in the chemotherapy suite. So we, mm -hmm. my colleague Deb Burns, um, who's at Indiana University and I, who's also done a lot of work in cancer care. She and I designed a study where we're, we're trying to understand, well, what's the benefits of these sessions? Mm -hmm. We knew anecdotally from work with patients, but we wanted to understand more. So we, we compared um, a whole bunch of outcome measures between this stress management-based imagery work and music listening, because we were wondering, well, is music listening alone sufficient? Is it just really about providing some kind of music during chemotherapy or is it mm -hmm. more specific to an intervention? And, and the results were overwhelmingly that the intervention was way more effective in doing two things, reducing stress and anxiety, but also improving people's ability to cope with their treatment. Mm -hmm. So the music and imagery experience actually really helped a person to feel what we would call more resourced they were able to connect with something positive inside of themselves, a resource that helped them to manage their experience. And I think this was the really the biggest takeaway from the study is that, that the music experiences not just help to reduce symptoms, but they also help a person feel that they're better able to cope with their experience. Hmm. Right. Now, um, can you also describe a little bit of how the experience looked like for the patient? Yeah. So you think about an hour session with somebody and you divide it into three parts. So at the start of the session, the therapist talks with the patient about essentially what they're experiencing. So they could talk about feeling really stressed about the treatment today feeling really anxious about the needle stick or about the side effects that go with the treatment or just generally kind of overwhelmed with what's happening to them at the time. And then from that, we move into a guided imagery experience using recorded music. So this is music typically that's either from the classical or new age listening genres that's played ambiently. And one of two things happen, or actually three things happen in the session. 
the patient either then moves through a guided relaxation experience. So there is different kinds of guided relaxation experiences. Autogenic is one such example, breathing kinds of relaxation, guided relaxation. So something that's focused on the body. Then there are other kinds of experiences which involve imagery. So for some folks, they really like to focus on the chemotherapy drugs positively impact in their body. So they're imagining the drug supporting, reducing the tumor size or having some kind of positive impact. So it's kind of supporting the actual treatment itself. For other folks, they really want to focus on some kind of positive image. So this could be a spiritual image, um, a church or a religious kind of image that's important to them. It could be a place in nature, it could be supportive people. In other words, the, the image is a metaphor for some kind of internal resource that they're able to connect with and they're able to utilize it to support their experience of care. Right. Okay. Well, and so they are, they go through the intervention and then you say that what the study found is that um, the actual intervention is having an impact in their stress levels. But then you also mentioned that they feel more resourced, right? So can you explain a little bit more of what that means? Yeah, I mean, the resource means a couple of different kinds of things. For some folks, they feel that their body is replenished. So mm -hmm. chemo is very fatiguing for the body. And so they feel that they have more energy, they feel that they feel more centered or they feel more grounded or they feel more capable. Some kind of felt body experience that can be really helpful to people when they're going through it. Okay. Another, kind of, another kind of resource is, is a, 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 what you might call a cognitive awareness. So they connect with a memory or some aspect of themselves that they've been disconnected from because of the chemotherapy. It, 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 and it's usually feeling related. I, I feel like I can, I can manage this. I feel like I can do this. I, I feel much more connected to my strengths as a person. And that, mm -hmm. that th this I think is important for people, especially during chemotherapy, because they're, they're, many people will talk about the cancer as, as something that they experience in their body and that it's it's taking something away or it's it's negatively impacting something. And so they they feel less capable or less confident or less what I would call resourced. Yeah. Resourced. It's so so these kind of experiences get them connected to something positive inside of themselves that they can take with them. It's it's a felt right. experience. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, just real quick, uh, we have Christine Lauren, who's a Shindor University alum, Cleveland Clinic Children's. Do you know Christine? Hi, Christine. Hi, back. It's very nice to um, meet you. Yes, and then Christine, uh, she is uh, she's actually my girlfriend. She's saying that the idea of resources is very interesting. So, yeah, I agree. Um, and then the other question that I had on this was, so you did the research and obviously you had been working in this hospital for, for many years. So obviously they see the value of it. Yeah. Um, but I, I also think that sometimes not all hospitals see the value of music therapy. So I was just wondering what's your opinion on what's the importance of research on I don't know if convincing is the right word, but like making sure that hospitals realize that music therapy and other creative arts therapies are valuable for the health of the patients. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great question. And the answer is, I think that it's essential. Um, and I, I'll give you an example, actually two different examples, if you like, but one, and you, we can follow up if, it, if there's enough time, that um, in um, around Washington DC, which is where I live, um, there's a very large hospital system called the ANOVA healthcare system. And mm -hmm. uh, about five years ago, um, a really wonderful private practice um, called A Place to Be started a music therapy program in the ANOVA healthcare system. It was somewhat of a pilot program um, and it was focused in one hospital and it was 
um, one of the areas of focus was the intensive care unit where the music therapist was working. And this music therapist, Ray Leone, um, in his master's studies research here at Shenandoah, designed a study in which he looked at the impact of a music therapy intervention in the ICU. And uh, he was he uh, received some funding for that research, and he was able to work alongside some of the nurse researchers that make up the healthcare team there. And um, this study was a very successful study. The, the findings were very compelling about the effectiveness of this intervention, and the article itself was published in the American Journal of Critical Care. Mm. But what, what happened in the course of just this one study was that it showed for the nursing research team there that music therapy um, is able to talk the same language as the nurse researchers and is able to contribute to healthcare in ways which are measurable and in ways that others can relate to very, very clearly. And so since that time, we have now two other studies going at, at the hospital system. And that because of the good work of the folks at A Place to Be, there's a very big possibility that the, the services will expand, not just to four music therapists working in the system, which is what's happened since this pilot project, but even larger number of, of, of music yeah. therapists working in the system. And I think that um, I, I'm sure that the quality of the clinical work was crucial to this expansion of the services. But I'm also sure that having research supporting the interventions has had a really big impact. Yeah, definitely. And I'm also aware obviously how much research is happening at the, our, our partner hospitals for Sam's fans. But I do know that, for example, at Dayton Children's, uh, they didn't used to have a music therapist and then we helped start the pilot program. And now the hospital wants to have the music therapist, whether there is outside organization or not. So they saw the, the benefit from it. But I'm also thinking that uh, for us as an organization and for people advocating and supporting music therapy, we can definitely also look at well, do we need to also fund research to make sure that hospitals understand the benefits and yeah. that music therapists are able to have these tools. Yeah, I mean, we, we um, um, the, the Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C., I think is a really good example of that, where the, the music therapist who's working at the, at the moment, M.G. Riversberger, he's doing some research on um, sickle cell pain, a music therapy intervention to reduce pain associated with sickle cell disease. And um, they've just announced a second position there at the hospital uh, just today, um, which is really, really exciting. And what MG is seeing as being necessary to, to sustain and to grow the program is that there needs to be a research initiative there that's a real, a real strategy as part of their work. That, yeah. that what we see at that hospital is that the quality of the clinical work uh, grows the program and this is what especially um, funders are really very interested in but I think it's showing the benefits over time which sustains the program. Definitely yeah I, I think that's very exciting and mm, really yeah, I think I'm going to look more into what kind of research is going on in hospitals here in Ohio. Yeah. That would be interesting. Yeah. Uh, but I also wanted to uh, talk about the the other part of or other part of your research which is on clinical improvisation. And I'm also personally really interested in this because uh, I studied jazz music before coming into music therapy and I love improvisation. So um, and I've looked into your your most recent study was the synthesis, right? So you looked at a lot of music therapy research on clinical improvisation and you sort of analyzed and did a lot of things with that. So maybe first, uh, what would be good is if, if you can give us a definition about clinical improvisation and how that can be helpful for patients and clients. Well, um when you improvise clinically, you, you make up music for 
or with a client to serve a clinical purpose. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a myriad ways of going about improvising with somebody, but I think the question is why do you do that? And right. um, how is that different from having somebody choose a, a, pre a preference of a song, which is often a way a music therapist works, and it's a really very important way of working is to draw upon clients' music preferences. But there are some situations in which improvising is, is really, really important, and it brings a different dimension to, to our clinical work. So um, there are some experiences that you have as a person that, that you can't very easily define or work through in a structured medium. For example, pain. For example, sadness or grief or loss or for example even anger um, that these are felt experiences and they're experienced very uniquely by people and that that the way that we can help a person to both experience these very unique kind of feelings and to work through them with the person is to sound them with them so improvising becomes, becomes a way of sounding another person and sounding another person's experience. And that this is, a, this is for many folks a very profound way of hearing their struggles. They actually hear them around themselves. And um, for conditions like pain, this, is, this can be really, really impactful for a person because pain is an experience which is this, so embodied and so deeply personal that it's an it's a quite an incredible way of it, of experiencing an emotion. Yeah, I like that. So, and I think there are other things as well. You know that sometimes when we're working with folks, um, that they have a, a different kind of consciousness or different kind of ability. So, somebody who might be have just had a stroke and their way of apprehending sound is different, that you, that you have to go out into their world, you have to meet them in a place, and that this requires you to use the musical elements and to reach over to a person, which is very different from recreating. You, you're singing, um, you're vocalising as a way of connecting with the person, you're improvising on the guitar to to capture a kind of a feeling that you feel with the person. So you're really using the music to connect with and to join with another person. And this is done improvisationally. Right. And would you say, I kind of have this feeling that the idea that clinical improvisation is or can be done really with a patient or client, you say that there is an notion that we all are in a sense yeah Sam I'm sorry I missed a little bit of that so would you mind saying it again I just uh, there was some yeah some feedback on the on the line so for sure I was just saying that I feel like there in the idea of clinical improvisation there is notion that we we all are musical beings right? we can express through music and therefore have a connection yeah, I mean, I would, I, I would, um, I agree with you. I think that's really true. That I, I think that I would put it in a different kind of way uh, as well. And is that that I think that we all have the desire to be creative, mm -hmm. and that what what makes our life meaningful is our capacity to create. Right. Um, and that you know that this this goes for whether it's a child who's stuck in bed and not able to get out and pray with their friends, that, that they're able to still create music. Improvisa improvisation is about creating music in the moment and it draws upon all of your capacity to think about things when you're doing that. And similarly, if you're an adult and you, we'll go back to the pain idea, if you're an adult and, and you've got this pain and you can feel it in your body and you can sound that, then you're creatively taking on your pain. This, this takes the person away from being um, um, unable to do anything about 
what's happening to them to actually engaging in the very thing that's the problem in their lives. And I think that this is really a very empowering for people. So it, it draws upon our, our capacity to be creative and to find solutions to our problems. It does it in a way which is musical. And so there's the aesthetic experience of making the music and doing that with another person. And then from that, something happens. It always does for people. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's also an important point and something I'm curious about because, um, you know, I, I don't have any clinical experience, so I have this idea that improvising with clients, you know, it, it does all these things that you're talking about, but. Um, I've really only in my life improvised with other musicians. Yeah. So the idea of improvising with somebody who doesn't really consider themselves a musician and who might not think they have the ability to do that. Um, just from your clinical experience, would you say that they want to connect with you and have an impact on their life? I mean, the answer is yes. The, I think that, that there's a caveat to that, though, which is important, and I think it connects to our skills as a music therapist. Uh, improvising is not for everybody. You know, the, there's no modality which, which suits everybody or suits everybody at a particular moment in time. So our skills as music therapists are to know what the modality is that best meets the client's needs. So, um, and this is, this is really a skill to be able to do that because you are, you're, you're aligning yourself with the client and you're understanding how the modality helps, whether it's recreating a song or improvising or writing a song, what, you know, these are all different ways of being involved in songs, but they serve different kinds of therapeutic purposes. Right, definitely, that's a good point. Um, so we're, kind of running out of time here. So I just want to say to our viewers, if you have any questions for Dr. Meadows, feel free to ask them now. Um, we had some other, I mean, we could talk for a long time this year. You have done a lot of things that there's definitely a lot we could talk about. So I'm just curious also if you have any thoughts you want to put out there, anything that you really want to tell our audience. Well, just that I'm excited about the field and I'm excited about where we are as a juncture in the profession and that I think that um, that there are many, um, we're moving in the field from, I think, what people might call valuable to essential. That's, that's the kind of transition that, that's happening professionally now and that, that this is a very exciting time to be living that. Yeah, so. yeah that's, that's fun. Um, and for us at Sam's Place, it's really interesting also to see, you, see it from a different perspective um, because we're not necessarily there doing the actual job. We're not there doing the music therapy. Uh, but as nonprofit that supports these programs and that helps fund it in different hospitals. It's also encouraging to see how hospitals are now also interested in putting uh, the effort to the time and the money into these programs so that it is a partnership. So yeah, I, mean, uh, I will say yeah. go ahead. No, just um, that, you're, that you're right, that we're seeing a lot of growth in the medical area. Um, in in the greater DC area, and I, and it's really exciting to see it. Yeah, and for me personally, I think it's also well in Mexico the situation is not as promising. But I think also realizing that there is so much progress in the US, which is our you know our neighbors. It's also kind of encouraging for me to be able to bring some of that into my country and then be able to also help. I think also globally that there's been a lot of progress and I see it being here in Germany with people from all over the world and see how things are running all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, 
I would love to have you another time as well if if you're interested. I think there is a lot more that we can talk about. Uh, and this was really enlightening. I really appreciate that you joined. Um, and then also for anybody who, who joined to watch, we appreciate you. Thanks for being here and thanks for supporting Sandfans, for supporting music therapy, also our therapy, and all the wonderful things happening. Um, yeah, I would just finish by saying that we have more exciting interviews coming. We have somebody from um, said Akron Children's next week, but then we're actually going to have Dr. Kenneth Nagan at some point, and Dr. Noah Potman also is. So every Wednesday at 3 p.m., hope to see you there. And thank you again, Dr. Meadow. Thanks, Sam. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. And then, so, uh, 